Ever been curious about the background of your favorite Naraka hero? Perhaps you haven't been able to finish their cultivation, or want to learn about a hero you don't plan to play. Welcome to the Naraka Legends lore series, where we tell the heroic tales of each character verbatim from the in-game chapters. Join us on today's quest as we delve into the history of... I am Hadi Ismail. Pursuit of learning brought me to this land. The youngest scholar in Lunazra's history, a man with great talents and a deft hand. If not for that fateful accident, he would be on his way to becoming a teacher at the academy, respected and looked up to by all scholars. However, his river of destiny still brought him to Morris Isle, where he will complete his journey. I am from Lunazra, second son of Red Dove City's lord, and Hadi Ismail is my name. In three days, I shall embark on a perilous journey filled with danger and the unknown. Therefore, I decided to first record the previous chapters of my life in writing. It all began with the mineral called Diusol. More than 80 years ago, the scholars of Lunazra's academy and the priests of the temple issued a joint declaration, an unprecedented event in the kingdom's history. Yet the contents caused even more of a commotion among the people. Diusol once revered as a relic left behind by God, was reclassified as a common mineral. Consequently, the ban on its extraction was also lifted. Countless merchants, scholars, and craftsmen reveled as the news traveled. The city and its lords, the Ismail family, my family, the ones who have ruled Red Dove City for generations, were immersed in festivity. The reason for it was simple. My home, Red Dove City, was situated atop a rich vein of Diusol. Human desires are boundless, and Dussel brought unprecedented prosperity to Red Dove City, propelling the ambitions of my father and brothers to their zenith. Those very ambitions were what prompted me, who had been wading quietly into the river of destiny for 18 years, to plunge into its current. That day was probably the hottest one that I can remember. The night before, I stayed up late with my father and brothers, entertaining wealthy merchants from Ikuria, and it wasn't until high noon the next day that I finally arrived at the meeting point with my mentor. The man was enjoying a lunch break. Two eggs were cracked and spread evenly on a flat circular stone, and within moments, golden bubbles began to form on the surface, much like Dussol itself. From a cloth pouch, he took out some spices and sprinkled them evenly over the eggs. My stomach couldn't help but growl as the fragrant aroma wafted to my nose. Young master, have you not had breakfast yet? My teacher broke his meal into half and handed me a piece. Thank you, teacher. But I'm still feeling stuffed from the rich roasted lamb they served last night. I refused the meal and motioned for him to enjoy to himself. And please don't call me young master. I will forever be your humble student. After swiftly finishing his meal, I was thanked graciously for secretly providing him with eggs and spices, sparing him the necessity of subsisting on cold and dry biscuits like the other slaves but I didn't like being on the receiving end of his reverence. It was not I, but my master and people like him, those who are brimming with wisdom, who are deserving of such respect. Young master, today we will dig deeper underground to find a clean water source. The man's eyes, slightly clouded with age, gleamed with excitement. I hoped he won't be contaminated by Dusol again. Um, I extended my hand to my mentor, who gave a respectful smile as he accepted my help pulling himself up with his hand on my forearm. I would never forget the sensation of his rough palm, because that would be the last touch my right arm would ever feel. We had to walk to the desert edge before we could spot the entrance to the well. I had seen it countless times on paper and in diagrams during my three years of study at the Royal Academy. But to witness its vast scale with my own eyes left me in awe. At least a hundred people could circle the well, and that was just its periphery. This wouldn't have been possible if you hadn't written the letter to reason with the city lord, he told me as we descended, all the while offering caring reminders to watch my steps. Once we arrived at a certain depth, I was pointed to an opening. This is the fourth well we've dug. From the bottom of the pit, I was shown three other wells, located slightly higher up, guarded by sentinels. There was a sigh in his voice. The water from the first three was spoiled as Dussol had leached into it. The Lord has temporarily sealed them of so that more Dussel can be extracted in the future. They want to extract more? I could hardly hide my surprise. Yes. I'm sure this does come as a surprise. 
as you've just returned from the royal capital, but the Lord had come to an agreement with Ikuria's merchants to sell all the firearms we produce for the next few years. The most important parts of the deal, of course, are Diosol in its unprocessed form and the gunpowder refined from it. What about water? I blurted out. Large quantities of water had to be injected underground to fill the void created by the extraction of Diusol. This was to ensure that the surface wouldn't sink in as the material was taken out. The same method had been used by the city for over 30 years, a method gained from the wisdom and sacrifices of countless craftsmen and slaves. While Diusol had brought prosperity to the city, it had also exacerbated its water scarcity, already a serious problem given its location on the edge of a desert. The Lord, the nobles, and the merchants, blinded by the riches and power brought by Diusol, averted their eyes from its problems. Even my father and brothers, the potential wealth and power they could gain from Diusol, as well as the desire to surpass Lunazra's six great cities, even the royal city itself, had blinded them all with greed. In fact, I received even more horrifying news from my mother upon my recent return. My father and brothers were preparing for war with the other cities. I couldn't help but furrow my brow at these thoughts. Creak. Young master, look. My mentor's voice and the sound of grinding gears echoing in the cave interrupted my thoughts. By the time I realized it, we were already at the bottom. The slaves toiled diligently, turning the handles of the machinery, driving the gears that turned the chains, which in turn controlled the upwards and downwards motion of thick pistons, ultimately powering the auger that bore ever more deeply into the ground. As they drilled, the surrounding layer of soil gradually collapsed. Amazing! It was the first time I had seen the actual workings of this mechanical device since its design. The schematic you provided has made work much easier, young master, my mentor remarked as he returned to my side after inspecting the progress of their work. It's your knowledge that's most important here, teacher, I replied earnestly. Without knowing where to find water, any efforts to dig a well would have been in vain. This time, I intend to stay home so that I can learn the art of locating water from you. If it's knowledge you seek, you should venture eastward to Luria. Back in the day, had I chosen to journey east, my river of destiny might have flowed into even broader horizons. And I knew that my mentor, a wise and learned citizen from Holoroth, was made a slave as a victim of war before being sold to Lunazra, eventually finding his way to Red Dove City. Recalling the stories he shared with me in the past, my hand couldn't help but shake as I ran it over the damp cave wall. It's coming up! Excited shouts interrupted my thoughts. I wiped the mud from my hands and rushed to the drilling site with my mentor. I could feel joy bubbling up inside of me like a freshly emerging spring as I saw clear water bubbling up from underground. This meant that Red Dove City would have several years without having to worry about clean water rumble. However, just as everyone was celebrating, a series of unsettling sounds entered my ears. I separated from the crowd and placed my hand on the cave wall once more. It was vibrating. By then, the rest of the group had also sensed that something was amiss. Everyone exchanged glances before finally casting their gaze on my teacher and me. Bang! Beside me, a screw shot out from the iron frame of the machine that was fixed to the wall, ejected by overwhelming pressure. There was no time to think. I instinctively threw my right hand at the warped metal bar, desperate to hold it up. Run! The tunnel's collapsing! I shouted at my teacher, who was frozen in shock. Just then, a crack emerged on the cave wall. The slaves all ran for their lives, and my mentor had also finally come to realize the severity of the situation. Taking one last look at the water that was still spilling out of the ground, he rushed over to help me. Don't come, I'm losing strength. I stopped him from approaching. This place is going to collapse. Ah! Just as I was about to release my grip, Rocks fell from the ceiling, crashing onto the supports. Bits of metal pierced through my arm, and the last thing I could remember hearing before my vision went dark was the sound of my own scream. At night, I was awakened by the excruciating pain radiating from my right arm. I tried to raise my right hand but found it utterly powerless, so I tried to sit up instead so that I could examine the extent of the damage to my right arm. To my horror, I discovered that everything below my right elbow was simply gone. A fever racked my body for three days after I lost my arm. I heard from my mother later that as the cave collapsed, 
Copious amounts of dusol leaked through the cracks, dripping down and drenching my right arm with it. So, as to prevent the paste from entering my body through the wound, my mentor made a swift decision to sever my arm. But my father tossed him into the Colosseum for his life-saving act. Before meeting his end in the ring, he shouted his name to the crowd as they all bore witness to his existence. Omid! As soon as I'd recovered enough to regain the proper function of my weakened limbs, I made the best decision of my life. I secretly took my teacher's urn and followed a group of Icurian merchants eastward to the land of prosperity, civilization, and unlimited knowledge, as it was in my late mentor's heart. The journey to Acuria was a decision I will never regret. It brought me not only great enlightenment and knowledge, but also many friendships were forged. These friends included the ruler of the seas, the mistbreak dragoness Valda Kui, as well as her loyal sworn brother and captain, Yu Shaw. At Northwest Ikuria, where wealth from mining and metallurgy flowed freely, the young master of the Liu family, a modest and courteous noble, and last but not least, the one that always brings a smile to my face. The granddaughter of Valthika Shen's family from Thunder Cove, Feria Shen. I followed that group of Ikurian merchants for nearly two months before we finally arrived at their destination, Lunazra's Herring Gullport. The long journey left me fatigued, but there were some advantages. My unkempt appearance and untrimmed beard served as excellent camouflage. The Icurian merchants didn't suspect the traveler who occasionally appeared by their side to be the second son of Red Dove City's lord, a young noble who had once entertained them and demonstrated the power of Dusol firearms. I stayed in Herringal City for two days, during which I discovered that the Icurian merchants had chartered the most famous merchant ship in Lunazra, the Golden Porpoise, for their return voyage. Thus, I devised a plan, seeking out the vice captain and bribing him to take me aboard as a sailor. In the following days, I gathered the supplies needed for my journey and kept a close eye on the movements of the Icurian merchants. I also had a prosthetic hand fashioned out of steel to replace my missing one, hiding it under a pair of camel leather gloves. I can no longer recall exactly why I felt the need to do that, but perhaps my pride was worried that would be seen as lesser compared to anyone else. The merchants seemed to be all prepared, yet they remained anchored. As I eavesdropped on their conversations, I learned they were waiting on a young woman named Feria Shen. They spoke of her with strange expressions, a mix of fear, disgust, admiration, and dotage at the same time, which piqued my curiosity. Fortunately, the wait wasn't too long. As I stood on the deck, I finally saw the girl they were talking about. Though she was not quite as I had envisioned her, the girl was barely a teen and was dressed in the extravagant attire typical of Luna's Ran nobility. She rushed to the pier on her horse and jumped off, but after a few strides, seemingly annoyed by her dress, she yanked off half of her skirt to free her legs before dashing straight for the head of the Icurian merchants, a kindly old man named Ping Shen. I hope to God that Feria never chances upon my writing, but I simply can't hold my pen back. I must record Mr. Liu's evaluation of Feria. She's like a mud monkey, he said of her. Though I found this assessment rather inappropriate, I can't help but agree that Mr. Liu's description captured her essence perfectly, as I recall my first encounter with her. It was at sea where I encountered Feria once more. There was a commotion on the deck, and I had gone up to investigate the noise out of curiosity. I heard the other sailors gossiping about a Luna's Ran noblewoman who had been rescued on a nearby island. She claimed that her family had been attacked by pirates and that there were still many other nobles who were imprisoned on that island. I was about to return to my cabin to continue working my schematics when I heard a young girl's impatient voice. I turned to see Feria frowning at a wooden box full of parts on the deck. Taking a closer look, I wondered, could it be? Weren't those pistols from Red Dove City? What a pity. I shook my head and made to leave. Stop right there! Why do you say that? I was stopped by the sweet voice of a girl, speaking in fluent Luna Ran. I can tell you're trying to change the structure of the grip so that you can reduce the recoil, but to modify it in such a way would hinder the release of Dusol upon ignition. Not only will that compromise its power, you may even risk the chamber exploding in your hands. You seem to know a few things? Feria raised her brow at me with a suspicious look in her eyes. I studied in the academy for a bit, I replied not wanting to reveal my true identity. Then, let's have a match. We'll see if your theories makes you the better expert, 
or my own tinkering and practice. Without even giving me a chance to speak, she dragged me into one of the cabins. I was surprised that such a place existed on the ship. I looked around and saw walls covered in drawings, tools scattered on the floor, and a table covered with parts, on par with a small workshop. Faria Shen pulled out two pistols from a box and skillfully disassembled them. Let's begin. The rules are simple. Whoever assembles it faster wins, and the loser has to recognize the winner as teacher and treat them as such. A provocative grin appeared on her face as she challenged me. Dare to take me on? Yes. Faria was determined to see the match through, but I was also young enough to be itching with competitive spirit at the time, so I accepted her challenge. Inside the cabin, only the sounds or parts clicking and scraping against each other could be heard, as well as sand falling through an hourglass. As the last of the sand was about to fall through, Faria had already raised her pistol and aimed it at me, whereas I had only just finished assembling mine. You're not taking me seriously. The excitement on her face was gone, replaced with anger. You only used your left hand. Are you insulting me? Just as I was about to explain, shouts from around the ship could be heard. Pirates! We're under attack! Prepare for battle! The voices warned. Faria's angry expression turned into panic. I gestured for her to hide in a nearby cupboard while I drew my scimitar and hid next to the cabin door. The commotion on the deck did not last long. When the noise died and the only thing I could hear was my beating heart in the silence, the door was kicked open. Instead of rushing in, the intruder shouted to his subordinates to be cautious in their search. But I knew that my ambush had failed, so I stepped forward to duel him, wishing for a miracle that we could come out of this alive. At that time, I had no idea that my opponent was the second in command of the Mistbreak Dragoness's fleet, Yusha. But I still can't help but shudder now, as I recall our battle on that day. Yusha did not underestimate me, even though I was still in disguise as a Lunazran sailor. His trident moved swiftly and relentlessly, often striking me from unexpected angles. But it was his terrifying strength that was most worrying. In just a few blows, I had torn the web of my hand as I defended myself from his attacks. It did not take more than a few minutes for my clothes to be torn into pieces by the tips of his trident. Is something wrong with your right hand? He stopped his attack and asked with a questioning squint. I was about to give my answer when I noticed Faria silently sneaking out of the cupboard with a pistol in each hand, aiming at Yusha while trembling in fear. No! At the critical moment, I lunged in her direction and knocked away the barrel of her pistols with my right arm just as she pulled the trigger. The scorching air waves and muzzle blasts of her firearms burned several large holes in my leather gloves, exposing the blackened steel skeleton inside. Surrender! We surrender! I shouted anxiously in clumsy Icurian. Later when I sparred with Yusha, he asked me once why I helped him then. I just smiled in response. I recalled the thought that flashed in my mind then. Faria's river of destiny had only just begun flowing. I wouldn't be able to forgive myself had I allowed it to be stained with crimson so close to its spring. When he was still alive, my mentor often said that he was like the flowing water of the Yushan Mountains that had mistakenly flowed into the Western Gorge. And his greatest wish was to know how his river of destiny would change if it had flowed eastward instead. It wasn't until the end of my journey north. See, from Acuria's Thunder Cove, passing through Centralis, Fortuna, and the city of Tang in Holoroth, where I finally arrived at the base of the plumed castle in Maytab, that I finally understood the words he spoke then. What he longed for was a free life where he could travel far and wide in pursuit of knowledge. Initially, I thought that the last thing I could do for him was to bury his ashes atop the majestic Yushan Mountains, yet I never imagined that I would have the opportunity to change the destinies of countless others, people like my mentor, so that they were free once again. The flow of the River of Destiny was such a peculiar thing, I could never have imagined that I would one day come to work under Holoroth's prince. News of Holoroth Academy's reconstruction in Metab led me to visit the scholar and craftsman overseeing the project, Master Karim. After a lengthy conversation, I was offered an unexpected introduction to Prince Half, who, in my opinion, seemed like a just and wise ruler at our first meeting. Little did I know that the prince and Master Karim were only interested in my expertise in crafting firearms, specifically because they were planning their second attack on the city of Tang. I had heard about the dispute over the rightful heir to Holoroth, 
It was during the first war between Maytab and the city of Tong that Omid, my mentor, was dragged into the conflict and became a slave. Over the more than 20 years that passed since then, the armies of Lunazra and Ikuria had engaged in several skirmishes within Holoroth. Looking back on those times, it was evident that Prince Hafa's body was not the only thing being fattened up in Holoroth, but also his ambition. It was evident that not just Prince Haf's body, but also his ambition were growing in Holoroth. My debate with Karim took place one rainy afternoon in a secret room under the abandoned Manticore Arena. The heat was stifling, and the atmosphere was tense. Prince Haf sat atop a platform of raised sand, listening to my opinions from across a makeshift table of sandstone. I remember that a bead of sweat had trickled down my forehead, itching like a poisonous insect crawling on my face as it ran down. I wiped my face with my hands, and the rough calluses of my left hand and the coarse leather of my right glove woke me up slightly. Next to the table were the siege weaponry models that Master Kareem had just showcased to the prince, like predatory beasts with bared fangs, ready to tear apart anything in their path. In Kareem's description, the three-tiered war machine was as tall as the city of Tang's walls, equipped with eight spring-loaded wheels for moving across rough terrain, and housed a giant ram powered by Dusol gunpowder. The second tier featured a foldable siege ladder, and the third tier was a walled compartment with arrow slits capable of housing at least eight archers. Master Hadi, what do you think? Asked Hoffa as he twirled his graying beard with his chubby fingers. The cost of these siege weapons is exorbitant, but they'll be rendered useless once they're damaged. If Curia's firearms division collaborates in the defense of the city, then I estimate that they will have at least three methods to counter our weapons, I replied, cautious in my choice of words, as I hope to dispel the prince's thoughts of war without angering him. Master Karim, could you prepare the necessary gunpowder? After receiving an affirmative answer, I requested a few tools from Karim and asked for some of the prince's time to demonstrate my conjectures. Once everything was prepared, I pushed the siege engine out while leading a cheerful Prince Hafa and a proud Master Kareem onto the sandy grounds of the arena. After aligning the contraption, I pushed it out, but it had only moved creakily for a short distance before a deafening explosion suddenly broke out from the ground, sending the siege engine toppling backward and engulfing in flames. Master Kareem's face twisted into a deep frown under the light of the flames. Uh, this is a landmine, a product created by a curious firearms division three years ago. Once buried in the ground, the device is practically invisible. Yet the moment that something heavy lands in its path, it will detonate instantly, obliterating everything above it. I explained to a shaken Prince Hafa. Master Karim, do you have any other strategies in reserve? Karim hurried back to his chamber and returned shortly with two models in hand, placing them before Prince Haf. One was an unusually large cannon while the other was a stone-throwing machine built using the leverage principle to launch boulders great distances. What if, Kareem proposed, we could shatter the city walls from a distance? With gunpowder refined from Deusol, we could turn the city of Tang into a blazing inferno in just one afternoon. He picked up a branch and drew in the sand, all the while presenting data to prove the feasibility of his siege engines to Prince Haf, Prince Hafa turned his gaze to me, seeking my opinion. While striking from a distance is an option, it cannot guarantee the safety of the machines nor the lives of the men who operate them. I, I shook my head before retrieving a small device from my pouch. This was crafted by a young girl from the Valtheca several years ago. We sailed together on the seas once. This device helped us communicate with each other between two distant ships. Uh, a warm feeling welled up in me as fond memories of the girl with her radiant smile surfaced. She called this device the wooden owl. Ots adjusted its wings and tail and wound it up before presenting it to the prince. Following my instructions, Prince Haf activated the wooden owl, which shot of like an arrow, striking Kareem's model cannon with pinpoint accuracy. Now, how would Master Kareem deal with the wooden owl if it were filled with gunpowder? Yes. What would you do, Master Kareem? The prince asked, intrigued. Kareem's face paled and his eyes darted back and forth. Finally, he appeared to have come to a resolution and beckoned me over so that we could discuss the topic further. But when I approached him, a dagger was drawn and pressed against my throat. Hadi, my friend, do you know what is most vital in warfare? Kareem asked before offering a grim response. 
It's people. I may not understand why you've aligned yourself with the city of Tang for so long, he continued. But I know that eliminating you here, he paused and shot a glance at the prince before concluding, would bring no harm to us. In fact, it could do us a load of, I sighed heavily. There's no need for, before Kareem could finish his sentence, he was thrown violently against the arena wall. Prince Half pointed at my now missing right forearm, mouth agape in disbelief. With a shrug, my right arm, which had been launched out, returned back to its place. After clicking my prosthetic arm back into place, I waved my hand at Prince Hafa, reassuring him that there was no cause for panic. That's exactly right! The essence of war lies in people! I grabbed my scimitar and pointed it at the somewhat bewildered Kareem. The wealth of resources that Ikuria holds far surpasses your imagination. The reason my mechanical arm functions flawlessly... I extended my right hand toward Kareem, who was still on the ground. The fingers of my mechanical hand clasped around the back of his hand, yanking him back to his feet, is due to the limited knowledge I gained of their engineering, coupled with training from their martial artists, who taught me how to manipulate machinery with my inner energy. But there's another critical aspect to warfare, Kareem shouted, still trying to argue his point with Prince Hafa. Indeed, I interjected, and that is wealth. The newly founded city of Tang has thrived for a century, backed by the abundant iron mines of Ikuria's northwestern province of Fortuna. In contrast, we rely solely on Lunazra's Chamber of Commerce for support. If those merchants fail to amass enough profits, then even if Prince Half ascends the throne of the Plumed Castle, his reign may very well be short-lived. Gim, my words silenced Prince Half for a moment before he once again voiced with some reluctance. So, what then, according to Master Hadi's counsel, should I rely on to secure the throne? First and foremost, it's imperative you abolish the trade of slaves, establish an academy, and reduce taxes. As long as the commoners of Holoroth are willing to rally to your flag, the throne will naturally come to you. I removed the deerskin glove from my right hand, as there was no longer any need to conceal my prosthetic. As if on cue, a beam of sunlight pierced through the clouds, casting its radiance onto my open palm. Become the legend you were destined to be. If you enjoyed this video, please help grow the channel by liking and subscribing. See you on the battlefield, brave warrior.